All right, good afternoon. Such a large room, such a small presenter's table. <laughs> we, are, we are the tail wagging the dog here. So um, thank you very much for uh, turning out uh, at, at, at this point in the conference when everybody's brains are surely full. Um, so we're really grateful that you are spending time with us here. This is called The Future of Liberal Education in the New Learning Ecosystem. Uh, my name is Randy Bass. I'm the Vice Provost for Education at Georgetown University, and I'm chairing the session. And I'd like to start with an assertion that any conversation about the future of education that begins with technology is almost certainly doomed to a diminished vision of learning. Or <laughs> to <laughs> Woo! This is like the State of the Union address. These are mandatory standing ovations from half the room. Well, sorry, excuse me. Significantly less than half the room. <laughs> so. Or to turn that around, if you begin with a narrow or granular view of learning and education, then that will significantly shape what it is that you value about digital technologies and their promise for higher education. So what are the conversations about technology that are dominating right now? Online learning, learning management systems, adaptive learning technologies, intelligent tutors, flipped classrooms, learning analytics, e-readers, courseware, MOOCs, MOOCs, SPOCs. <laughs> These are the implementations and embodiments of digital technologies that are dominating our landscape, getting traction on our campuses, all intrinsically valuable in one form or another. But many of the qualities and characteristics that are among the most salient in the emerging global web environment, online communities, peer mentoring, connections, resource sharing, purpose-driven networking, these have made at best only marginal impact on our teaching and learning in our institutions. So why is that? Why is it that what so many of us feel is so exciting about the transformations in our culture that are going on all around us, that are reshaping our lives, our personal lives, our own personal sense of well-being and connectedness and enrichment? Why have they made so little impact on our institutions and inside the classroom and inside our curriculum? It seems to me that there are the sort of three narratives that kind of dominate the technology conversation right now. One is what we might think of as the iron triangle narrative, right? the, the productivity narrative, that technology is finally going to allow us to break the iron triangle of costs, access, and quality. Right? Costs, access, quality, pick two. Helps us break that iron triangle. There's the quality narrative that's starting to grow that mostly is around personalization of instruction and flipped classrooms. So that's working its way in from the edges. And then there's the disruption narrative that we've been used to for a few years, which I would interpret in part as being what is the least amount of new technologies we need to adopt in order to preserve our business model? <laughs> All of these narratives really grow out of the learning paradigm that started to take over our institutions from the 90s. Many of you will remember the shift from the instructional to the learning paradigm and the uh, article in 1995 on the switch from teaching to learning. All of these impulses grow out of the learning paradigm. 
But there's a split logic, what I think of as a split logic to that learning paradigm, that the real tension of our time is not between online, face-to-face, -face, it's not between traditional, non-traditional, it's not between scale and intimate, it's between integrative, an integrative vision of education and a disintegrative vision of education. And the disintegrative vision grows out of an impulse to improve learning just as much as the integrative. It's just a matter how you define learning. So this panel really grows out of trying to find a different way to talk about the impact of the emerging digital learning ecosystem on our institutions. Uh, like the panel that uh, I was on yesterday, it's directly related to the AACNU project uh, called Project GEMS, General Education Maps and Markers, asking, in the case of our role in that project around the digital, what is the digital opportunity for advancing a robust vision of general education and liberal education in our institutions? This panel, who I'll introduce in a moment, is really driven by trying to ask that question about the digital opportunity for higher learning as a design question. If you're asking or having a disruption conversation, then it's about how it is that despite what's going on around us, we can stay who we are. But if you're asking a design question, you're asking what is it that we want to become? What kinds of institutions should we be in 10 or 15 years? What kinds of graduates will we need to be producing in 10 or 15 years? So we're trying to ask on this panel, probably not answer, just ask, the ultimate design question for us right now, which is, what is the version of liberal education that is only possible at this moment in history? What's the version of liberal education that's offered to us by this moment in history. So that's what we want to discuss today, and we're going to discuss it interactively among the panel and between you and the panel. No formal presentations, no preparation, no forethought. <laughs> <laughs> It's 2014. <laughs> Let me introduce our panel of distinguished... <laughs> QED. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce our panel of distinguished provocateurs. Immediately on my left is Jose Antonio Bowen, who's the president of Goucher College. Gardner Campbell, vice provost for learning innovation and student success from Virginia Commonwealth University, and Elizabeth Clark, professor of English from LaGuardia Community College. So I'm going to start by just ask, throwing out a question, and then each of them will respond over three to five minutes. We would like to display and scroll the Twitter feed, and if you'd like to uh, pose questions, then we'll be monitoring it and try to respond to them when we get to the interactive part. And we're using the hashtag LibEdUnbound, uh, which is hip hashtag speak for liberal education unbound. So it's the AACNU stream, LibEdUnbound. You can see that there. And uh, every once in a while, I will hit all. These are all new tweets, right? Okay, sufficient. So let me start by asking uh, you folks to respond to the question of thinking about big ideas. If we are going to step back and ask about what is it that we, how is it that we should be thinking about this opportunity uh, with this emerging uh, global learning ecosystem, let's start with key ideas or what we might call threshold concepts of, of the ecosystem. What would you say are, you know, two or three big threshold concepts to you um, that connect the emerging digital culture to a, 
this moment of reimagining liberal education. So I think there are uh, at least three uh, that I that I always talk about. Uh, the the first is you know customization and gamification. Uh, you know, students now live in a world where they get points for everything, uh, and frankly, so do you. I mean, you know, the uh, you know, airlines, hotels, uh, you know, we collect points, we get badges. That um, that's a whole new concept, and you know, I, I actually do think um, people will be getting points for brushing their teeth and then getting a coupon for toothpaste, and uh, it is motivational. It it, it works. Uh, at one of my campuses, we talked about a, you know, improving wellness on campus. Right, great. So what did, what did we come up with as, a, as faculty? How about a course? Because right. the answer to everything in our world is a, a course on wellness. And it's just like, no, we don't need a course on wellness. We know what to do. Uh, we just need points for riding the exercise bike. Um, so we thought, oh, great. Well, if you do enough time on the exercise bike, you'll get a badge, and you'll have, you'll have passed your wellness. And the students said, no, actually, we don't care about your stinking badge. Um, but if my friend has more points, I care. So, you know, turning it into a, so actually you want to improve wellness on campus, create a wellness game and, and so you can eat the least amount of pizza and the most salad and the swipe your card and the right, you know. So gamification, customization. Um, the, the other big concept I think is, is, has certainly arrived is the meaning of social proximity. Um, uh, we have to give students a reason to be physically proximate now uh, because so much of what they do, uh, they can do online. Uh, yes, there is sexting. Um, when they can do that, why would they come to class? <laughs> yeah, don't ask. Uh, just look it up. Um, or ask, a, ask an 18-year-old. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, so much of, I mean, just the whole nature of intimacy uh, proximity, coming to class. Uh, there's got to be something beyond what happens in that world. Um, uh, but to me, the, the big threshold concept that, that really most interacts with liberal arts is our relationship to knowledge. Um, that we now live in this knowledge-rich world uh, where, there, where there is way too much knowledge, right? Which seems like a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. Uh, so the things that we traditionally do, critical thinking, uh, analysis, uh, discernment, those things have just gone up in value. Uh, knowing lots of stuff has just gone down in value mm -hmm. because Siri knows more than you do <laughs> and always will. Uh, and every student has a phone now that has access to all of this knowledge um, and most of it is garbage. So being able to sort through it uh, becomes more valuable. Um, I'm trying not to steal what I'll do tomorrow, but uh, if you come tomorrow, I'm going to have you Google yourself and then have your neighbor, neighbor Google you and then compare the difference, because those are different. That, in fact, Google is a customized search engine, and so it's feeding you what you want to know. I mean, this may be the most dangerous, pernicious piece of software in the world, because Google isn't an, an objective, fair, on in, in any way, shape, or form, so, but we all verb, we all use it, I mean, we all use it as if it were an encyclopedia or a dictionary or easy access to content, and it is. Uh, but, but we now live in that world with easy access to all sorts of stuff, and we f have to stop and think, no, that's just what Google thought I should know, or what Siri thought I wanted to know because of my history. Um, it's the Fox News problem. Uh, and so we're all, all of you are now listening to Fox News exclusively or your version of it, right? You're just getting what, so that is a world into which our students are gonna graduate. Um, and so understanding how to break that cycle, how to, how to deal with the overload and the morass uh, of, of information um, changes what we do fundamentally. Uh, that, you know, I often say professing, right? If you're a professor who knows a lots of stuff, your value's just gone down. Because Siri professes too, and so do those people online. And so what, we have to do something else to add value. I have three threshold concepts as well. Um, one of them is that we should be thinking about augmentation, not automation, when we think about the digital learning ecosystem. The real gains in liberal learning are going to come from thinking about these machines as machines made to augment human intellect. That's part of the title of an essay by Doug Engelbart, published in 1962. It should have been required reading in my own liberal arts undergraduate career. It was not. 
I discovered it in a trade magazine in 2004, which may also say something about confirmation bias in the academy and how syllabi might need to be refreshed over time. Um, but I, I warmly recommend that essay to you. Engelbart talks about an integrated domain in which we're using high-speed electronic aids as well as sophisticated concepts in a kind of symbiotic relationship. He calls it an integrated domain. He uses that phrase. Uh, so first, augmentation, not automation. These are not tools. They are extensions. McLuhan was right. Think about the hammer. Think about your hand. When you pick up the hammer in your hand, what do you have? Not a hammer in your hand. You have a hammer hand. It's a new thing, a new thing altogether. And sometimes the things that we automate, we shouldn't automate. I think about online registration, which was a powerful, symbolic pain in the you-know-what back in the day when you had to go actually imagine it, stand in front of a professor and ask to have a card to get into the class. Uh, absolutely inefficient ritual, except it enacted uh, the way convocations can, a certain key moment in the life of the intellectual community. Now when you sign up for a learning experience, it's like online banking. And I'm not sure that that's a gain, uh, although my registrar will shoot me when I get home. Second threshold concept is network effects. They're very unnerving. One smartphone is useless. Two billion smartphones continue to gain in value every time a new smartphone comes on the network because of the possibility of interconnections. But they are very strange. To understand Twitter, you have to get your head around the possible beneficial effect of network effects. And network effects in a runaway mode are, are pretty bad, like the control rods out of the reactor, right? You don't want to go there. But they are also another name for what we call civilization or consciousness, or a library. The density and possibility of interconnection is what strengthens a network. And the way these interconnections interoperate is what John Seeley Brown calls hyper-exponential, because you can form sub-networks within the networks. And that was a network effect that was telling you that. But do beware Campbell's law, which I didn't write, which is that any single measure of performance inevitably corrupts the performance because the thing you're trying to measure goes only towards that single measure, which it seems to me is kind of the anti-network effect. And for the third one, I would say that the threshold concept, and I'm an English professor too, I just want to do full disclosure here so you know what you're in for it now. The computer is an instrument whose music is ideas. That's a threshold concept. It also happens to be an aphorism by one of the inventors of portable networked computing, a man named Alan Kay who worked at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, I loved it so much I got him to write it in an anthology. You know, there's nothing like having the analog representation of a beautiful concept right there in a book you can carry around. I believe that what he meant is that computers were invented for shared mental work to be able to acquire a vast range of representational possibilities. We can present the working of our minds and the hearts that animate our minds to each other with a rich repertoire of symbolic possibilities that we've never had before. And if you're connected to the network, you don't have to have a license to make that symbol or to learn from that symbol. It was harder for me to become a radio announcer in the 1970s than it was for me to buy a domain on the World Wide Web, which can lead to a lot of garbage. I promise I try not to put garbage on there myself. However, I think that's right. I think in a democracy, having that kind of access to the computer as an instrument whose music is ideas can potentially bring all of us into the access to that deep kind of learning that I think liberal learning stands for. Okay, um, so we were talking about this panel. We were thinking about moving ahead 10 to 15 years and what is the academy going to look like. So I thought it'd be kind of a hoot to go back and take a look at the Chronicle from 10 to 15 years ago. So here are a couple, um, not a scientific study, but a couple of headlines uh, related to uh, digital technology. November 21st, 1997, universities struggle to eradicate the millennium bug from computers. Um, <laughs> 1998, colleges' mailing costs 
could climb as much as 25% in January. <laughs> November 1999, author warned students and colleges to avoid online education. <laughs> July 2000, grants for research to support international digital libraries. In November 2001, MIT begins effort to create public web pages for more than 2,000 courses. Um, it's just a quick look at where we were a while ago. Um, I arrived at LaGuardia in the fall of 2000 and immediately uh, started doing ePortfolio work in 2001-2002. So my entire academic uh, professional career has really been focused on digital technology and ePortfolios and what that means in the classroom. Um, so I always bring to my work that perspective of not really knowing what it was like to teach without that. Um, I also just want to say quickly on registration, um, quick anecdote, at the end of last semester uh, we were wrapping up and I was telling students, advising them, uh, you know, what they needed to take next and what the next courses were like, and a student uh, said, yeah, but Liz, we need to know what your course code is for next semester. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy to share that. And they said, no, no, we have to know so we can put you in our shopping cart. <laughs> online registration, right? Um, okay, so my uh, threshold concepts are uh, defining new curriculum, curriculum standards, and what we mean by learning. So we've heard that um, when we look at a tool, it becomes a new thing, but are we actually treating this new opportunity as a new thing? Or are we just trying to repackage what we've always done with some shiny new tools? Um, Kathleen Yancey, who's in the back, uh, wrote a phenomenal piece, Writing in the 21st Century, where she talks about composing new models of teaching writing, of what we mean by learning writing and defining writing. Have we done that for higher education writ large? This is really a huge opportunity to define where we're going. If you've been following the Twitter feed for the conference, um, Karen DePauw uh, tweeted in the last session, research is clear that higher education is in chaos. It's a moment of disruption due to digital learning technologies. But let's not run from that, let's embrace it with research and practice and let's do it smartly uh, and figure out where we're going. I think another moment is learner ac um, analytics. How many of you are wearing a Fitbit, a Jawbone, or any equivalent right now? Can we just see hands? Okay, great. And how many of you are also tracking your steps, your food, your uh, exercise on your smartphone with the app throughout the day? Okay. So we're at a really, I would suggest, the, an infant stage of learner analytics in higher ed. If we could get learner analytics to be as sexy, as easy to use, and as informational as something like a Fitbit, if we had an academic Fitbit for our students, it would go a long way towards really helping students to achieve that student-centered learning because they would really understand where they were going, what they wanted to do, and what they needed to do to get there. Um, if you think about it, you know, my sort of, um, my dream other career would be to be a marine biologist. But if I had an academic Fitbit, it would definitely be showing me that I needed some tutoring, some support and some help in advanced science and mathematics because those are not my strong points. So if that was really my goal and if that's where I wanted to get to, having that kind of information would help me chart uh, where I wanted to go. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about integrative learning and student-centered learning on the panel. Um, I think that we talk a lot about student-centered learning in higher education. I think that it is jargon that we use all the time. I think there are very few practices that we actually use in higher education that are truly student-centered pedagogy and student-centered learning. So let's really get serious about thinking about what that would look like. And the last one that I have is the way in which the um, digital ecosystem allows us to think about the give back factor. Um, if you know anything about the polio vaccine and Jonas Salk, you'll know that he didn't patent the polio vaccine. Um, for the historians in the room, I'm not going to address the specifics of why Salk didn't patent that vaccine. If you're interested in that, I would recommend David Oshinsky's Polio, An American Story. But what I want to point to when I think about higher ed today is that I'm often brought back to his other assertion, that when he was asked who owned the polio vaccine, he said the people. And that was really um, more than a nod to the initial field testing of 650,000 children and their doctors and the more than 80 million donations that went into making that vaccine possible. 
we have a moment where we can really think about what we can give back in higher ed, and we have means to distribute that knowledge that we co-create with our students that helps people to think about the university in a totally different way. Thank you. Uh, great answers. Um, just to build quickly on Liz's last point, uh, to recommend Jaron Lanier's book, Who Owns the Future? which suggests that there's an alternative way to think about the future of the web that, uh, in which our data is not taken from us, mm -hmm. monetized, and then what we get in return are free toys, but that there are yeah. other ways to think about the future of the internet around our data, very similar to what you were saying at the end. So thank you. So, so many of the things that you all mentioned are these salient uh, threshold concepts or forces that are arising out of this uh, new digital ecosystem um, that we could make better use of in higher education, that we could import in, that we could, we could learn something from. Let me flip that question around then and sort of borrow uh, Stefan Collini's uh, phrase from his book about higher education of what are universities for? And ask, well, so then in this larger learning ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem in which universities no longer have a monopoly on learning, what is it that colleges and universities can do uniquely well? What is it um, that we're for? What is it that colleges and universities will be uniquely for in 10 or 15 years? So there's an idea out there that in 10 or 15 years, most companies that survive will either be uh, specialists or aggregators. And that makes some sense to me. Uh, and I think that colleges and universities are largely both. Uh, but with the tools to be able to get information um, anywhere more quickly, uh, I think that will make the specialists more specialized uh, and will mean that most of us can't actually sell ourselves as specialists in a discipline. You know, when, when there are hundreds of uh, of, of, of lectures and papers and learning tools from Harvard and MIT and, and Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, uh, do we really need one more uh, periodic table learning tool uh, or a million more? Uh, so I think most of us are going to be aggregators. And I think, especially in the liberal arts college, um, that's something that we can do very, very well. The, the internet is fundamentally disaggregated. Right? Part, of the, part of the problem with all of that knowledge uh, is that it's biased. Uh, right? Google is, is biasing it for you as you get it. Um, and part of the problem is that there's, it's out of context, that the context is not necessarily transparent, that when you, when you see a link uh, and you click on it, um, you don't necessarily, you, know, you don't even have to look at the whole page. You can just look at the image, and then you get the option. Do you want to go to the page or just, no, you just want to look at the image. Um, so it's disaggregated. You, you don't know what the, con what the context is. Uh, and we are people of context. That's, that's what we do for our students most of the time. Uh, so, so building con context uh, and integrating and aggregating and helping students integrate uh, is something the internet doesn't do well. The, the internet can feed you lots of content really well, it's got to find lots of stuff, uh, but as we all know, learning is about what happens to you after you integrate that content. Does it actually change your mind? Right? Not did you memorize it, can you spit it back, but did it change the way you look at the world? That's a, that's a much harder problem, and I think to echo some things that you've already heard, we talk a lot about it, but do we really do it? I mean, the evidence suggests that, that colleges don't change minds, uh, previous, see previous panel, um, right? That, uh, but now is the chance to do it with new tools, but also it's become more important because if we don't really change minds and help students learn how to change minds, um, then we are all going to be living in the era of, of Fox News and people will just continue to listen to only what they want and, and not even know it. Talk about, forget Big Brother. Everybody will just be feeding themselves what they want to hear all of the time and our society will become more and more polarized because we haven't addressed the central problem which colleges were created to do and can do uniquely well, which is to teach people to actually change their minds. So one of my favorite teaching aphorisms is, I can't teach you anything, but I can save you some time. I think that's <laughs> curriculum in a nutshell, as Austin Powers, one of my intellectual mentors, would say. Um, 
But that really is one of the things you can get in a critical mass within a university or college context that is difficult to do within the disaggregated environment that Jose was talking about. Um, we also can help, it seems to me, in uniquely pow excuse me, powerful ways to empower each other, not just give our students, but also receive from them strategies of self-monitoring and self-correction. We have some space to be able to grow those within our institutions that a lot of the world doesn't leave uh, space or time enough to do. We can embody, we can model a culture of education that builds human capacity as an end in itself, that human capacity is itself a good thing or can be, um, although of course it doesn't happen automatically. So if we can, within colleges and universities, increase the pursuit of the capacity for the pursuit of wisdom together, we may be able to model something that I think the world needs. And the other thing I'd say is that the word university is an interesting one. It's derived from a Latin phrase, it turns out, which roughly means a community of teachers and scholars. And I don't think that the possibility of that community is as visible elsewhere. Uh, Jerome Bruner, who's someone I pay a lot of attention to, uh, talks about raising awareness of the possibilities of communal mental experience. It's another way of talking about that human capacity. Um, universities, in theory, uh, can be about this, but note well, what we are able to provide as a model to the world is more a matter of culture than of co-location. And I appeal to all of you in the room who have ever been in a faculty meeting that the whole face-to-face -face gold standard thing sometimes <laughs> isn't so much. So there are times I wish we could just adjourn in the middle of one of those department meetings. It was an English department after all. And just <clears throat> go into our offices, sit, meditate, no quick emails, probably even abstain from Twitter, much as it hurts my heart to say so. And, and then maybe write a little reflective piece that we could share with each other a little later on. <laughs> a boy can dream. So, if we can establish a genuinely, um, a, a, a genuinely collaborative, cooperative, not dissent-free, but, but, but somehow unified community uh, within the culture of education as a way of modeling the possibilities of communal mental activity, uh, then I think we can provide some good to the world. And, I, and I'll tell you, I'll just end on one cautionary note. Many of our students have found a lot of raised awareness about the possibilities of communal mental activity in places that are really stimulating and interesting and we take no notice mm -hmm. of and may even deride. <clears throat> I would point simply to the fan fiction culture as a place where without a rubric, a credit hour, or a grade point average in sight, students, learners of all ages, are writing thousands of words, mm -hmm. including fan fiction around paradise lost. I rest my case. <laughs> um, OK, I have four. So I'll give you the four, and then I'll, I'll walk through them quickly. Um, I think what we have to offer is modeling expert learning, the era of teaching, the era of equity, and a what-if proposition. Um, so in terms of modeling expert learning, building on what we've already said, badly designed online courses basically ask students to watch videos, read some stuff, and take some online quizzes. OK, so what's the difference between that and reading an interactive book or looking up some stuff online that you think is really cool? There's nothing that contextualizes or distills that experience. So one of the things that we have to offer is helping think about how you actually become a learner. Um, because those online courses that are working well and ones that are designed really well work very well for highly motivated learners who are technologically adept and who have a certain knowledge base that they can build on. That leaves out a huge number of people. Um, the niche of colleges and universities is really about rethinking the faculty relationship into a mentoring relationship that helps students learn how to be learners. 
Um, there's a lot of room to think about the space for open educational resources designed by faculty as part of their work to redefine education. Why do we have students buy textbooks when we could be creating open educational resources co-authored by students and shared with students, both current and future students, and with the community? There's a lot of room to think about how students working in conjunction with faculty can create uh, knowledge and share it in their communities. We talk a lot about citizen science, and that's a term that we've become really familiar with. What about citizen history? What about citizen writing? What about citizen medicine? What about citizen reading? Um, how can we really help to make the university a place where Portland State's motto, one of my favorite um, higher education mottos, let knowledge serve the city? How do we do that? That's something that we can offer in this new ecosystem. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have read um, Jacques Berlinblau's piece in the Chronicle um, about teaching. Yeah. At colleges and universities, something that we are experts at is teaching. So let's create an environment where that happens. Let's commit to faculty development to help faculty keep up with changes. Let's make teaching a central focus of what we actually do and not what we say we do. MOOCs and other online courses, as I just said, work great for students who are highly motivated, uh, technologically literate learners. How many of you have taken an online course? How many of you have done well in the online course? Okay, I'm, I'm going to do that again and have you take a look around the room. How many of you have taken an online course? All right, look around. How many of you, keep your hands up for a moment. How many of you have done well in that course? Okay, useful to think about the reasons why those of us who are expert learners have not necessarily done well in those courses. I got bored. I got bored because if I wanted to go read a book, well, then I'll just go read a book on my own time. Um, you know, so what is it that in the era of equity, if we sometimes are not doing well in those online courses, how can we create a society and an educational model that works for everyone? What about those students who aren't technologically literate? And they are out there. And they are in your classrooms, even if you think they aren't. What about people who are not motivated and who need uh, some time to mature and to think about what education means? Are we just going to leave them behind? Are we just going to say, sorry, you're not motivated enough. We don't want you? That's not the that should not be the motto of higher ed, that we want it to be a place just for the people who think they belong. It's a place for everyone. So how do we make that happen? And here's my what if proposition. Um, I'm sure you can see, I'm a big Apple girl. Uh, I love Apple. I have all my Apple suite of Apple products. Um, I love Steve Jobs. I think his story is pretty amazing. Um, I think that he's an interesting person to study. But if we think about the fact that Apple is perhaps one of the biggest success stories of the last decade, um, I'd like you to also think about how many iPhones, well, how many iPhones do we have in the room? Okay, look around. So we're all Apple people. Okay, so are we going to talk about the problems and exploitation of workers in China who produce those, those devices for us? Are we going to talk about the use of conflict minerals like uh, tungsten? Are we going to talk about how these devices that we use impact other people? My what if proposition is, although Steve Jobs was a brilliant man, what if he had been the product of a liberal education? What if he had been at an institution where he was wrestling with leap outcomes and not just thinking about technology, not just thinking about design, but thinking about the impact of what it was that he was going to build? So last the three questions. What is the one downloadable app or tool that will achieve everything you guys have been talking about? <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> is that our deliverable, Dr. Bass? <laughs> yes, that's right. That was just a joke. <laughs> Everybody had their pens out. <laughs> so, putting these two things together, the forces of the digital ecosystem, what is it we do well? Let me ask this question, then we'll open it up. We're clearly at a moment when we have to then very rigorously distinguish between what we might think of as our core practices and our habitual structures. So the question for you is, what feels fundamental to our 
habitual practices that will have to change to move in the direction, the, the directions that we're talking about? Or to put that more positively, what is it about the kinds of things that you're saying are these opportunities of this emerging ecosystem that make it possible to give up something fundamental to our, to our structures now that we couldn't even have thought about giving up 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? And who's willing to say it? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I don't think this is going to be easy, and I don't think we can do it piecemeal. I think this is a fundamental enough shift that if we don't reverse engineer the problem, if we don't start with the outcome, uh, we're doomed. Uh, I, I don't know who said it yesterday. I wish it was me, but somebody who said, you know, the, the, the higher ed bubble is not going to burst. It's not a bubble. It's a slowly deflating balloon. So we'll probably limp along, a lot of us will limp along for a long time. Uh, the, so relationships to me, the, the student, faculty, the mentoring, the community, that's something you can't get online. Uh, but the, the courses, credits, grades, semesters, the funny hats, where does say any of that is a fundamental for the liberal arts experience and for learning? I mean, those are the systems that we currently use, and they might be fine, but we can't start by saying, well, we have to preserve the semester. We have to preserve grades or these other structures and tenure. We, we can't start with, well, we have to have all that stuff. Now, how do we adjust slightly? Um, because we know how that story ends. Uh, it's called Tower Records. We'll just sell CDs. We'll still be called Tower Records, but we'll sell CDs. It'll be okay. Right? That doesn't work. You have to read, you know, the, you know, Pandora fundamentally shifts how people consume music. The internet has fundamentally shifted how people consume knowledge and how people learn. And, and well, you know, internet games, et cetera, have, have just changed the way people learn and changed the way they think. Uh, you know, I often use the analogy of, you know, exercise equipment. You know, more TV channels didn't make us smarter. More internet, you know, more content doesn't make you smarter. Uh, more fitness equipment isn't going to help. More professors are not going to help. You need a fitness coach. You need somebody to tell you to get on the bike, to, to motivate you, to take baseline measurements, to personalize, to save you a little time. Uh, so, you know, I, professor is probably not the title of the future. I'd argue it's cognitive coach. Mm -hmm. There is value in that. And so I think we need to restructure everything with the idea of what is the goal? Can we produce people who aren't just full of knowledge but can change their mind, can integrate what they've seen? You know, can we be an aggregator? And to aggregate means we can't just be cognitive coaches. We've got to look at the other, the other stuff too. Right? We spend all that money on student affairs, on athletics. Well-being is more than just how you think. It's all the other stuff. And so we've got to probably get rid of the divide between student affairs and academics. That's a false divide, right? We are trying to help develop young men and women to live happy, successful, productive lives. And we all know that being smart doesn't make you happy. <laughs> Knowing lots of stuff, right? And so, you know, at Goucher College, we have these three R's because we, we, we actually talk about happiness, right? Because happiness is actually the goal and, you know, relationships... Uh, resilience and reflection and, and yet you need some to learn some things in there too but those are the things that actually allow you to be successful and happy later in life uh, and you'll learn more stuff after college by the way so you know to me the looking at the whole person the Jesuits got that one right we'll give it to them uh, and and being an aggregator and trying to think all these things that we do that are expensive on campus from student life uh, to athletics to the dining hall can we use those experiences and have it all add up to something more than 120 credits? Because it's more expensive. It's, right, otherwise, the, we're gonna, the cheap option is going to come get us. Uh, so I think it's going to have to be major structural. I'm not sure it takes four years either. Uh, it's lifelong. Uh, why not provide us for a fee? I'll be your lifelong cognitive coach. Because it's, I mean, it's not as if, I mean, who, who really believes it? After four years, you'll know enough. <laughs> Of course not. We, that's, we, we're trying to create lifelong learners, but we want to do it in four years. Now, you might have to come back for a checkup, right? Nobody says you've been to the doctor once you're done. 
right? And, and so the, how, how many years, how we do it, is it always residential, is it partly residential? Uh, but it's, my guess is all of those structures have to be rethought in light of what's the goal and how has the environment shifted. Perhaps the hardest question of all, we may guess wrong. We may let go of the things that define our unique mission as we embrace change. We may have done that already, um, but a lot rides on this. I'll say a couple of things that come to mind. We really do need to accept the scale of change we are facing. Uh, I quote this bit from Clay Shirky all the time, we're living in the middle of the largest increase in expressive capability in the history of the human race. And since expressive capability is part of the core, maybe it is the thing that distinguishes our species, everything else changes too. Now, in many ways, colleges and universities grew up because of a great increase in expressive capability, but the structures don't support the mission very well anymore. And so if we start with the mission and then define the structures, uh, I think we may find what it is that needs to change. But the second part is, where will that conversation happen? Will it happen in a general education task force? Might. I hear some nervous laughter. <laughs> Will that conversation happen, heaven help us, in faculty development workshops? More nervous laughter. You, you've been to these, right? Um, Well-intentioned, but what I've found as I've been working on some of this for the last few years, including faculty development, which is named different things in different places, is that the, the burning intellectual life of my colleagues doesn't emerge within faculty development structures um, because there's this fatal disconnect between methodologies and mission. There's this weird uh, moment when you say, oh, we'll learn rubrics now, and that has nothing to do with the thing that kept me up late at night reading Milton for the first time. Why would these things be distinct? And by making them distinct, what do we model for our students? In, in a lot of good talk about accountability and transparency and my, my new pet phrase, uh, downstream deliverables. Um, you know, true story. Um, you know, where in all of that is the thing that makes us, in that, you know, as in that poem uh, by Rilke, to, to look at an amazing thing we have done as a species and know that we have to change our lives. Um, that faculty development has to be that. I've had faculty members tell me that they, they find the entire culture intellectually arid. Um, and those are the ones who, who will talk to me, right? The others just either don't show up or they retreat to their offices. We have to accept that we're dealing in a period of adaptive change, not technical change. And I learned about this at last year's AACNU. Been thinking about this for a year. This is great. This is from a book by uh, Ron Heifetz and Marty Linsky with the somewhat sobering title of Leadership on the Line, How to Survive, or Staying Alive Through the Dangers of Leading, just what a vice provost wants to be reading. Um, and they're not kidding. I mean, they're, people who really do try to lead through adaptive change, there, there can be some mighty risks. But they write, leadership would be a safe undertaking if your organizations and communities only faced problems for which they already knew the solutions. Every day people have problems for which they do, in fact, have the necessary know-how and procedures. We call these technical problems. And most of the institutional conversation, it seems to me, is around technical problems. We just need to iterate through what we already know a little bit better. But they go on to write, there's a whole host of problems not amenable to authoritative expertise or standard operating procedures. They cannot be solved by someone who provides answers from on high. There goes the vice provost. We call these adaptive challenges because they require experiments new discoveries and adjustments from numerous places in the organization or community. And I can't think of any single thing that would be more beneficial in educational culture and higher education today than making it okay for faculty to make their learning visible, not only to each other, but to their students. And by learning, I don't mean learnedness. I mean the learning that is continuing. Faculty don't want to blog because they don't want to share their half-baked ideas. We require it of our students. There's a real mismatch there, and so we may have to give up the comfort of knowing that we already know, and that's going to be hard. Okay, so um, 
I think I'll build on that uh, for one second. I think we need to give up antique notions of the prof professoriate based on publishing models that do not exist and are collapsing around us as we speak. Um, I think that we need to rethink graduate training so that graduate students are actually trained for the jobs they're going to have instead of the jobs as they existed 10 or 15 years ago. Um, I also think that we need to get rid of the idea, and this is really important as we talk about a digital uh, ecosystem, the idea that technology is a cheap answer to everything. Technology will not solve your assessment problems. Technology will not solve your retention problems. Technology will not solve, in fact, any of the problems that exist on your campus because technology is just a tool that is going to help you figure out how to do things differently. Um, one of the first lessons, and Randy talked a little bit about this, one of the first lessons I explore with my students in Comp 1, uh, how to be a digital writer in a digital world, is the idea that free isn't free. And every time you log on to a cheap or free product online, you are giving up something that might be greater than you thought you were giving up. Um, so we really need to, we need to talk about that, we need to challenge that notion on campus, and we need to talk about the fact that to do a digital learning ecosystem well is going to take some investment, um, it's going to take money, and it's going to take investment of time as well. Um, I also think, uh, as we kind of think about structures and what works and what's going to support this kind of moving ahead, we really need to take a look at departments and siloization. Um, not just the divide between academic affairs uh, and student affairs, but the divides that happen within the curriculum within departments that want to own particular knowledges that get in the way of integrative learning and connections. And finally, I think, uh, as a, as higher ed as a whole needs to give up its superiority complex. I think people are tired of hearing that we think we know everything. Uh, we're living in an era where lots of people know things, and so we need to figure out how we can share what we know and how we know it well with people, but also give a nod to the fact that lots of other people know things too, so how can we pull that into the curriculum? It seems possible that the panelists have said something that has provoked thoughts from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like to turn now and invite people to uh, ask questions to uh, provoke them back. We have 15, 20 minutes for a little bit of conversation. I, I, I think we're actually using the digital mic, so you're going to have to scream. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, and we train them not to do that. My students say they raise their hands when they have answers, not questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, again, if, if, the, if the purpose, if the real purpose of a liberal arts education is to learn how to question, you have to be aware of what you're learning, what you're not learning, what your bias is, and uh, being self-reflective about that is the essential piece of it. It's actually more important than the, you know, what did you learn today? No, how did you learn today? Because that's what's going to keep you going. Uh, so in some ways, I think that you know, we all have to learn to be psychologists. Uh, that, that is, you know, understanding how the brain works and how people think and how they reflect uh, is actually a large part of what we do. It's not what we were trained to do, but I, you know, I do think that psychology is the new pedagogy in a way. And if I could just add one more thing. I learned this from a dear uh, and recently deceased uh, a friend of mine who's a poet, Claudia Emerson, go buy all her books, she's amazing. Um, she said one of the things about teaching is that you, you get students to talk about their learning, not just to correct what they don't know, but to help them understand what they don't know that they do know. Our students bring these extraordinary lives into our learning environments, and to them, their gifts may seem just like breathing. You mean not everybody can do this? So one of the great things we can do is to say, if you will share with me who you are as a learner, I will share with you that you're a star. I will share with you that here is your moment of excellence and you can move in that direction. We can be that kind of you know, Fitbit for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that our work at LaGuardia has really shown in helping students with their e-portfolios where reflective practice and thinking deeply about their learning is an essential component is also, um, you know, 
we work with a student population that is deeply at risk for many reasons uh, across the board. And that message that their story is important and that they have a story to tell is transformational in their lives and I believe will be transformational in our society and culture because they have so much to offer. But if they are not prompted to think about their own learning and the ways that they're stars, they are sitting there thinking that their stories don't matter. Other questions? I just want to be clear that we received no compensation from the Fitbit co uh, Corporation <laughs> for today's presentation. <laughs> In the back. Absolutely. I mean, for me, yep. Um, absolutely. For me, my answer to that is the, the give back factor, right? We want students, students are already experts at consuming media. They are experts at consuming culture. It's probably one thing that students do well across the board, no matter what other factor we look at. Um, we don't want them to just consume stuff. We want them to produce it. We want to be about the business of graduating students who are experts at producing and co-producing collaboratively things that go into society and help to shape, frame, and change uh, what's happening in our world. So I, I think that's the fundamental mission is to take on that language and say to students, it's great that you know how to log on to Facebook, um, but we, that's not being digitally literate. Being digitally literate is actually learning how to take water samples in the Gowanus Canal and log into a public database and then make that research available to help think about how we're going to clean up that body of water in New York City. Right? So I think it's, I mean, it's fundamentally about making them creators and co-creators. I think it would be very valuable for a basic perimeter on how computers work to be something that students uh, are brought to. Uh, now, the bigger question is, should we have computational thinking within the curriculum? Should all students learn to program? Uh, I think about that. I don't have a fixed answer. I can tell you, though, that to teach students about computing without teaching them about the web, without working on web literacy, uh, my fear is that just gets bogged down into yet another subject without becoming what we want it to be, what literacies are, which are empowering platforms for us to be able to work together and create together. So um, it is interesting, though, when you're when you're in an environment where still probably eight out of ten of my colleagues when I mention Twitter will say, oh, that's just what people have for breakfast. I, I sense that knowing that a computer has RAM and a hard drive won't help, that there's a basic misunderstanding of the fundamental promise and uncanny possibility of networks that, that needs to be worked on first. And our students don't really understand that either. They don't, they have Facebook. Facebook is not the web although Facebook wants you to think it is the web. Uh, the web is a different thing, and it could go away if we don't have a generation of, of web literate students. Yeah, and actually, uh, literacy is a great word here, because that's a large part of what we do. And literacy requires uh, both some content and a lot of context. That's what makes somebody literate, right? They get your references. They understand the context. And so uh, I think we do have to teach coding uh, we do have to teach, uh, and again, it's, it's that combination of both professional skills. Writing is a professional skill, but it's also a self-reflective, you know, it's, it's both, it's and. The answer here is and, that yes, you have to, I think coding uh, is, an, is a new foreign language, and it's the language of the future, and all students should know it. But it won't do any good, just, just as, you know, uh, learning only the, the verbs and the conjugations won't do you any good when you get to the country and you don't know the nuances and the context. So literacy means you have both. It's and. Uh, and so we have a new area with, in which we need to be literate. But as, as Gardner says, you know, we, we don't just need another subject, but we do need to continue to think about literacy uh, across everything that we do. 
I don't think it's so much computing across the curriculum. I think it's as long as we organize our academic work in departments and disciplines that we should all take on um, as part of our curriculum, helping students to think about it in that context. So for example, I teach basic writing and composition one as two of the courses I teach at LaGuardia and a component of every one of those courses is what does it mean to be a writer in a digital world? Um, and to, to teach that from my place of, you know, doing writing and publishing in that world. But I'm not prepared to talk about what it means to be digitally literate in the sciences, because um, that's not my background. But my colleagues who are teaching that are doing a fine job at that. I think it's a question of are we consistently including it across the board in ways that are appropriate. <laughs> I would, I would add something that uh, John Udell talks about, which is that computer programmers, by the nature of their work, not necessarily because they're thinking about programming per se, but the nature of their work requires that they've built up a suite of affordances for collaboration and very precise tracking of the various stages of the work. So there are working practices out of the community of programmers that it seems to me could be more widely adopted so that, for example, as I'm trying to work on a policy document, I don't end up with somebody's Word version with track changes on from two versions ago. Anybody who's ever tried to clean up some of that mess, all his email attachments, I will add, uh, knows that uh, there's got to be a better way. And I think our students could benefit, as they do their collaborative work, from thinking about some of the things that uh, data carpenters, for example, uh, use in, in their own practice. And in a sense, I think we're, we fall into the trap of our own, our own sense of disciplinarity. Uh, you know, I would argue that we are at a time of disruption also in terms of what it means to be multicultural, uh, what it means to be inter-multidisciplinary. Uh, that, you know, we inherited a lot of that from the last century and previous centuries. Uh, and we're now at a time where those things are going to be changing more quickly than our department structures can. And so, I certainly don't think our department structures are helping us in our, our notion of what it means to, to be in a discipline. Uh, and I don't want to suggest that you know, everything is interdisciplinary and disciplines don't matter. But what the disciplines are, what it means, because again, think about the word discipline. Uh, we need discipline. But are those the right boundaries and structures? And I think it's changing so fast that we can't tell. And so in some ways, the question is, is computer, you know, is, that, is that in the language department? Uh, or in the philosophy department, or in the technology department. Uh, and I don't think we know, but I think we can't start by asking the question that way. Uh, I think we have to start by saying, what are the literacies, what are the competencies? We know they're going to change. We probably can't create a structure that will last more than a decade. So why, you know, why try? Let's, let's assume these are going to be more temporary things, and they're going to change more quickly. And that's a very different way to look at our problem, because we are the people of tradition and structure. I mean, we are, we're still wearing the medieval funny hat. So I mean, we'd like tradition and preserving it. To now be in a world where everything is disruptive and constantly changing, you know, if we'd wanted to live with change, we'd go work at Google. We, you know, we'd like our safe, you know, but we no longer, we now all work at Google. We all now work in the Silicon Valley in an industry that's being disrupted. Uh, and you know, look at how it worked for journalists as well. So uh, I think we have to reinvent it and just get used to the idea that um, we're, we're, in, a, we're in, a, in an environment uh, where change is the new normal. That was like a terrible, cracky cliche. But, yeah. I think we... <laughs> Sorry. I, I just want to take over. <laughs> technology changes computing stuff. It might, but how we use it and what it means changes. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think of... Uh, much of what you said, that uh, Tony Carnavale, who runs our Center for Education and the Workforce at, at Georgetown, you know, he says that uh, the purpose of education has always been to help people live fully in their time. And I, I, at the same time, John C. D. Brown has said, um, universities are really primarily good at looking in the rearview mirror. So part of the question is how can we actually act very agilely to keep asking the question in the most alive way without a multi-year curriculum reform discussion, are we helping our students to live fully in their time? Yeah, no, I, th I think one of the things that happens in Silicon Valley is that uh, people go bankrupt, you lose your job six or seven times, I'll take you seriously. If you've been at the same company for five years, you must be a loser. 
what's wrong with you? And you know, we're, we're not used to that. But in fact, there is going to be blood on the field. That, that, again, unless you want to be the, below, the, the, the air slowly leaking out of the balloon, and we, we can watch this at many of our institutions, we're going to have to do what, what happens in most disruptive economies, which is that I don't know the answer, but we'll take a chance and see what happens. And people may or may not pay for it or want to go there. Somebody will get something right. We'll all jump on that bandwagon. Oh, that'll flop. That didn't work. They went out of business, but they tried something. You know. But you know, the, again, the beauty of app. You know, remember Newton? You know, it, they were. You know, the, they recovered. You know, the, the, the iPhone was better than Newton. Uh, but if you don't have any Newtons, you don't get to the iPhone. And so I, I think you know, we're going to have to have more experimenting, uh, more try and, and you don't know what's going to work. You know, we tried this video application, and uh, you know, I'd be, oh, it's not going to work. Well, I said, it might not. It's, a, it's an experiment. I, I don't know if it's going to work until we try it. And if I wait until I know for sure it's going to work, then we'll never try it. And then, you know, so I, I think uh, my guess is that the elites have the least incentive, those with the most resources. You got more students every year, you don't have the incentive. The incentive is for those of us in the middle. Uh, you know, most people, you know, that all of those critiques, most people don't go to elite colleges. They go to community colleges. Uh, they go to state schools. They go to regional state schools. So that's actually where most of the action is. Uh, and uh, community colleges have already been where most of the experimentation and most of the pedagogy has been. Sorry. Uh, that's been true for a while now. That's where a lot of the teaching and the experimentation has been going on, not at liberal arts colleges, sorry. Uh, so, and they have the hardest job. So <clears throat> we're already seeing amazing new innovations happening at, at that level. Uh, so I actually don't know what's going to happen, but I think we're going to see everybody outside of the top 25 look hard and say, I, need to, I, I can't just market my way out of the problem. You know, back to your issue of commoditization, you know, but we are a business. We have to have students who pay. So, uh, you know, so you, if you didn't notice that Royal and Company got bought for a ridiculous sum of money, 80, you know, $80 billion for student marketing of more applications, guess where that money is going to come from, right? Because it's only worth, it's only making about eight, eight billion a year now. Ten times the valuation, guess where that's going to come from? Your tuition. Your institutions are going to pay for somebody to market harder. That can't possibly be the solution. So the only solution is trying different things to differentiate ourselves. Because at the moment, we're all offering exactly the same product. You know, we all have the same four-year psychology and English and chemistry degrees. And somebody's got to start saying, well, I'm going to do a three-year degree. I'm going to do a five-year degree. I'm going to do something else. I'm, not, I'm going to offer it. You know. So we're kind of in this race at the moment to do new degrees. Eh, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's not real change. Um, we're going to have to see fundamentally different structures, and some of them will work and some of them won't. Um, two thoughts. One, um, Amazon is taking down the publishing industry, you know, one day at a time. And the publishing industry was absolutely seen as something that was a monolith in our, in our culture. But Amazon experiments, and they go back again and again and again. If you owned the first version of the Kindle, it sucked. It was a terrible product. It was bulky. It didn't work well. It was ugly. It was aesthetically displeasing. Did they give up? No. They went back and did it again. How many of you are using a Kindle or an e-reader today? Right? So, I mean, many of us, many of us are still like books. Some of us are doing both, um, you know. But I, I think that the answer can't be to duck our heads and say, you know, we're not going to experiment. We've got to experiment, but we also, higher ed writ large, need to also understand that sometimes when we experiment, we're going to fail, and that's okay. We can learn something from that. Then we need to see how are we going to go back and reinvent that again. My second response to you is, I think that sometimes if we look at some of the elite institutions, we forget that they are not bound by some of the same rules that the rest of us are. So there is a level of freedom and experimentation that sometimes comes with that elite status that is not given to um, colleges and universities at different levels, operating with a different relationship to public legislatures, um, you know, and all this sort of thing. And so maybe some of what's going on at elite universities, we might want to model because maybe some of what's going on there is really great and maybe we need to borrow that. And I would say that we have this illusion that what we do as we put our universities together, our curricula, our uh, academic policies, we're like the cooks in the kitchen. Nobody sees that. We just bring it all out on the plate, and it's a nice presentation. But I have this feeling that 
Whatever it is we do as a culture to shape our own commitment to being distinctive and embracing change somehow communicates to our students uh, what kind of behavior we're expecting from them. So it seems to me it would be a powerful advantage for an institution genuinely to embrace the kind of risk and tinkering that we're talking about here in a way that was visible to the students. It would, it would make them a little crazy at first. I'm not going to talk about the parents right now. Um, but it might catch on as a way of modeling the very kinds of adaptive capacity we're urging upon our students. The other thing I'd say is, as long as we're talking about students, uh, they're living these rich, messy, integrative lives. It, it, one of the ways to do this is to start and, and engineer backwards. One the, we're trying right now a quality enhancement plan at um, VCU that's thinking about integrative thinking by means of digital fluency. So this is a really strange and counterintuitive idea, but the idea is if we really have a, a strong digital literacy using networks well, being web literate, that will conduce to integrative thinking without a curriculum necessarily being re-engineered because it's the students going through these courses who are the most powerful sites of integration and you'll get a student blogging about connections between rhetoric and, let's say, microbiology sooner than you'll be able to figure out the FTEs and credit hours so you could actually team teach across those disciplines. Yep. It's 5.30, and I'm going to channel my inner Jesuit for the closing benediction. <laughs> There's an expression that we often use it, uh, in, in Jesuit education of the magus, the magus, which is Latin for more, the more, trying always to strive to do more and to be more. And we sometimes use the phrase uh, that it's a way of helping students discover their authentic selves, that the purpose of coming to this kind of education is to discover your authentic self. I think if there's one way to sum up the vast landscape that we've covered in the last 75 minutes, it's that we need as a community and in our own institutions to treat this as a complex, wicked problem, to, to treat the question of what does it mean for colleges and universities to find their authentic selves in this new digital learning ecosystem, that that is the most important question about the digital opportunity to be asking on our campus, even as we move forward with pragmatic and other kinds of implementations that help us do our work day to day. That who is it that we can be, given the current conditions, that feels authentic to us, that's our signature work. So thank you for your incredible participation and your wonderful participation on the Twitter feed. And thank you so much to our three panelists.